are here today with Eric Brosius, who works at Harmonix and has for the last five years. About five years, that's right. And uh, he's here today to talk to us about his work at Looking Glass, and uh, we'll just go through kind of a narrative of that and um, sure. uh, kind of segue maybe into some of the some of how that work relates to or doesn't relate to just at, at your current job. Sure. Sounds um, good. Cool. Um, so... Uh, what was, I, I guess we could just start with a little bit of your background before, uh, before Looking Glass and kind of how you got into the company. And- uh, sure. Um, I, um, uh, I'm a musician first really, and I wasn't really, uh, I didn't study for a game design or game, you know, or audio or anything like that. And a, I kind of stumbled into, uh, making video games because, um, uh, I was in a band with uh, another guy who I work with now, uh, Greg LaPiccolo. We were in a band in the 80s uh, called Tribe, and we were kind of popular around here, and we never really did much outside of the New England area. But some of the people who worked at Looking Glass were fans of the band. They used to come see us, and then they had a new project that they needed music for. So they had two of them, and they asked uh, uh, Greg, my bandmate, to do music for one of them, and they asked me uh, and my wife, Terry, to do music for the other one. So... Um, uh, Greg did music for the first System Shock game, and I and my wife Terry worked on music for another game they were doing called Terra Nova Strike Force Centauri, okay. uh, which was an old, you know, robot big shooter, kind of, yeah, three D, yeah. you know, outdoor thing. It was actually a really good game. But, um, and uh, and then after a while, our band, you know, kind of broke up, and I started, you know, you know, we started doing a more, you know, hired as a freelance kind of audio guy to help do stuff, and after a while, just kind of became full-time person. And kind of migrated over. Migrated into it. Yeah. That's right. Cool. Uh, so um, so you started working uh, just kind of part-time uh, while you were still in the band mm-hmm. on, um, and it was Terra Nova. That's right. Yeah. First. Mm-hmm. Um, do you, I guess, could you describe a bit of your experience of, like, were you, did you play video games before that, or were you, was it something that you didn't know much about? Did you know a little bit about it, or was it like this totally un- different world that you were coming into? Uh, I knew a little bit about it. You know, when I, uh, when I grew up, I, was, I played, like, arcade games a lot, you know, and I had, a, you know, had an Atari and things like that. But I wasn't a giant, I wasn't, like, a, a giant gamer at that point. And you weren't into PC games, which is what the games you were working on were. Right. I mean, I played a couple. I had played like Marathon was you know uh, mm. the Bungie game was mm-hmm. one of my favorite you know games early on but not a heavy gamer you know mm. didn't devote that many hours to it you know um, and and I didn't really so it was really kind of a learning experience I came in kind of you know green from the whole thing especially the sound design you know so how did you approach I, I guess like did, did you feel like you were in over your head or were you just like oh hey it's sound design I guess I'll just kind of learn a bit about games, or did you just kind of like were very intuitive about well, it? Or well, the, f- the first thing I was asked to do was really just music, you know, and just to write some music based on, you know, um, uh, a design doc, right? Okay, these are the kind of characters we have. This is the plot that, that's going to be. Here's all the worlds that we have, so we need a piece of music for this world and that world and that world. And so it was really just like based on more like, oh, well, I've seen movies that are, you know, have mm-hmm. similar mm-hmm. vibes, mm-hmm. so let me just try to do something like that. Uh, I also got to say that uh, the music uh, I, that we did was not that successful, and I think because I and because one of the things I didn't really know, I think uh, uh, about you know back then we were really dealing with um, you know really crappy sound cards and mm. a lot of FM synth- synthesis. So I made the stupid mistake of trying to do an expansive orchestral thing that when you c- crushed it down to an FM card, it just sounded ridiculous a little bit. So. Um, where Greg was a lot smarter than I. He, when he did System Shock, he did like an electronic score, right? Which, when you translate it down to the beeps and bloops of a FM synthesis, actually work really well, mm-hmm. you know? So it mm-hmm. translated really well. And the work we did, we tried hard. We got it to sound good on, like, if you, back then, if you had an all 32, the Sound Blaster, all yeah, 32. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. We put, we can put, because we, we put our own custom samples in, we actually got it to sound really good there. But if you had other cards, it just did not sound that awesome. Do you remember what what some of those cards were? Because I'm really fascinated because I remember having PC games at that time and I think I had like a Sound Blaster 16 for a while before I got the AWP 32 and I remember there was a, there was like the, the Roland and then there was like the Gravis Ultrasound. And yeah, like, all like, of those. Do you even remember that stuff? I now, remember or? some of that stuff. I mean, uh, some of the stuff was like FM you know, uh, based so we had to like sit there tweaking like, you know, doing FM synthesis which was like, it's a paint, right? I didn't know it. 
So you're just basically trying to, let me see if I can get a string sound by, you know, doing these modules and putting them together. And, and it was hard. And even on the nicer sound cards that were wavetable-based sound cards, we were, you know, wasn't really smart enough to know you know, we tried to like do custom things. I'm going to play these like really cool piano notes really down low and see how they sound. Mm. And well, they sounded terrible, you know, because it, they don't, they did, they only like did a couple samples across the whole spectrum. Now, on the All 32, that was one of the first cards that you could do your own sam sam sample bank. Mm. So I was able to like do a couple. Well, if I want those low piano samples, I'll make my own, and you know, you can upload them to the card and some guitar samples and stuff like. Which is why we were able to get it to sound pretty good there. But it, you know, it was just like not being aware of the whole industry and the whole thing that it just, you know, they suffered. The music suffered pretty, pretty badly when you played on other cards. You know. And you're talking about Terra Nova specifically. Yeah, that one. Yeah. So, so Terra Nova. So you did have um, the AW32 version with your custom samples and everything for yeah. Terra Nova, and, and you're saying that one was kind of less. I was pretty happy with it. I was pretty it was happy good. with that one. Okay. Um, but you know, um, it was less successful on other cards, and yeah. I think I. If I was wiser, I would have wrote, written a score that was closer to the, the technology we had. Mm. Trying to do something that was big and expansive on what we had was a dumb idea. Well, but, but, it, but I, can, I can see how you would take that route as opposed to what Greg did with System Shock. Mm -hmm. System Shock was a you know, cyberpunk, and, yeah. and Terra Nova was science fiction, but it, but it was kind of space opera, too. So I can imagine how you Absolutely. Had thought of like orchestral. And, that my, and the, my first instincts were to do that, but... Mm. I think it was my, you know, um, inexperience in, in the in the field that may, you know that would have been like anyone's maybe first instinct. Oh, sure. you know, I'll, I'll do this big thing, and you know, in practice, you know, it wasn't quite ready. There was no like streaming audio at that time. It was like this was before. Like so I remember, soon after that, like uh, not too much, well, like Mech Warrior came out mm -hmm. or something, and and that was where they had actually streaming WAV files, so you could actually mm -hmm. do stuff in your at home. And record it, and we'll just play back these nice, lush-sounding wave files. Well, we didn't have that, and uh, <laughs> they were not lush. <laughs> so, so you approached it like film scoring. It seems like. Well, I tried to, right. yeah, yeah. And 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 was it was it mostly like the missions? You just kind of had like one track. Like, was it dynamic at all? Or it was, was it? dynamic. Um, uh, it, it was. Uh, they had different levels of. We had for each. So the basic were they had like four basic planets in in the thing, mm -hmm. and each one of them had. Uh, a set of uh, a score. So, and it was all done in MIDI, right? Because we were playing ba back then, and each one had like like they do now. Um, uh, they had a, a, a like a two minute piece that was like a, I'm just exploring. Then I had oh someone's on my radar. There's some tension, and then you had your combat piece, and then um, and so we did the basic things like you know when this game you're running around on a planet you know exploring, and then finally someone comes on your radar or something in the distance, and then you know you. In the battle, so we um, so we had this kind of exploring piece that was supposed to evoke the mood of the planet mm -hmm. or, or something, uh, and then um, when uh, the tension level would rise, we'd pretty much immediately jump to the next section. Um, it was all done in, mi in MIDI, so we could kind of like jump on the beat, right? We put markers in the MIDI file to show, okay, like you wait, wait to the next beat or wait to the next measure, so it wouldn't cut awkwardly. So it wouldn't mm -hmm. cut, you know, yeah. and then. Um, we had we'd have like a timeout. Like if you entered the the second uh, the the second intensity phase and nothing happened for a while after twenty seconds or whatever, mm. then we would transition back to the first piece. Mm. And the way we actually did the transition, because nowadays you would like, okay, well maybe I'll do a crossfade between my tension music mm. and my kind of normal music. Well, I actually wrote MIDI files that I basically wrote two MIDI files. And played and you know combined like the MIDI files from both pieces and then like crossfade them in MIDI to huh. make them go and did kind of the math to figure out well what's the tempo difference between the first one and the second one and so that we actually in MIDI would do this kind of weird crossfade between you know and and was that something you hadn't thought about doing before or just like for the first time because it was interactive it was just kind of like wow I guess I have to figure out and, how and this the, works. the thing we knew we knew pretty much right away that if you're going if you're increasing in intensity. You can make your jumps quick, right? Mm -hmm. And almost you can hard cut them almost because mm -hmm. you want the the pow of being able to yeah. hold. But after, but when the intensity is ramping back down, that is like a as you're as a player becoming less excited and starting to calm down. You want the music to do it like over time. Mm -hmm. So um, when we are ramping down to you know 
at that down level, I would write you know a, a transition that was maybe thirty or forty seconds long, mm. that would kind of combine the two pieces, um, both harmonically and tempo wise and everything, so that you'd kind of get this. Oh, well, it's kind of it's kind of like a MIDI version of a cross of crossfading the audio. Now, was it music only on Terra Nova, or was it was there other kind of sound design, or was it mostly just music? Uh, I started out doing music, but I ended up doing the rest of the, the sound design also. Okay. You know. So, did you do like like voice direction? And, uh, and there was or, yeah, well, there was voices and sound effects and mm-hmm. weapon sounds and you know footsteps and you know, all that, all, all the that, whole sound design, all the kind of stuff yeah. for the game. Yeah, I mean, there, I think at that point, uh, I think Greg was done with. Uh, um, system shock or close to it, so he kind of helped me get set up with like the voice recording hmm. and the part of it and things like that. But yeah, because when we interviewed him, I remember he said that he moved over to being kind of like the AV guy. Yeah, he was time. like the head of the AV department. Yeah, um, and I was the lead on the Terra Nova project hmm. then. You know, so as I actually became more transitioned from just doing the music to okay, now I'm going to actually be the lead on the thing. Then hmm. um, I kind of took over wherever they had started. Hmm. With uh, the the sound design stuff, so cool. So so it sounds like Terra Nova was your big kind of tr- like trial by fire yeah. experience. And um, so, what was the next one? Was it? Um, let's see. After that, would it have been Thief or? No, I think we did. I can't remember. Honestly, I think we did. Um, uh, they had they did a couple flight simulators, Flight Unlimited. Yeah, and, there was and three I think of those, three of them. I think I did. Um, I worked on like the third one because I think the first two were kind of before my time yeah, or okay. right around there. And then we did um, a golfing game, if you can believe it. We did a British Open Championship golf, which. Uh, um, uh, and you and you did music for that. I did. I did everything for that. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. So so what was that like going from Terra Nova to golf? That was actually pretty cool <laughs> because uh, I was some of it was kind of the same, you know. Oh, I mean, by that, in the fact that. Um, so I, I, I listen to music like you know that you hear like on ABC Wide World Sports, you know, or at the Olympics, or mm. other stuff that I thought was kind of like that, like um, you know Aaron Copeland or something like that. So I, try, I was trying to do just music that was like, you know, it was kind of sporty, like TV Saturday yeah. afternoon, ABC Wild, you know, Wide World Sports, and that also had the kind of uh, you know I would like try to do something that felt like it was like British and ancient because you know the whole thing about <laughs> golf is like well it's St. Andrews and we're doing the old thing so you know I would like throw in you know bagpipes or something stupid you know, like that. So, but it was fun it was fun because we got to do at that point we could do some streaming wave files hmm. although they were all mono so all the music in that was you know kind of mono streaming uh, wave files do you know what year that would have been or roughly or oh god no uh, I, um, 96 97 maybe it could have been something like yeah. that. I, I'm, just, I'm just thinking of, of I think Terra Nova is 96 and Thief is 98. Yeah, so so, so 97 is a good bet. I would think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was fun. No, that was uh, I was pretty happy with the, the way the music came out. With cool, that, like that. cool. Was that, so so was that was it, did, was that a smaller project or didn't take as long or um, or is that not your memory of it? Uh, it seemed to be a. It was. It was. It was smaller. It was less expansive than Terra Nova. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Uh, they had a lot of VO, and that was the big thing. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. and because they had a kind of this um, AI where you know every time you hit the golf ball, uh, they would. They had announcers going, and they would say, "Oh, well, I could tell that. I could tell that he sliced it to the left, and he's like four hundred. He's still two hundred yards from the hole, and maybe he'll use a, a five iron." And they would. They mm-hmm. would cut up all these like snippets of audio. And the announcer would basically put together what he was going to say, just like on TV, based on that. You know? So, did you have to figure out how to, like, kind of algorithmically make that work? Like, who was saying what, when, and like, what would make sense? What's what voice cut to say next? That or? had to be done, but that wasn't by me. That was okay. uh, one of the guy, one of the lead designers who uh, of the game, his baby. That was kind of his. That was what he wanted to do. He wanted to make a game that's, that felt like you were watching golf mm. on TV, and mm-hmm. that, so he really did all the work. We did all the recording and all and the, the recording. all of the huh. you know editing and, and you know that kind of stuff. But he actually did all the design, so can't what, take credit for that. Was it difficult to do the recording for something that was so cut up and, and have all these like crisscrossing ways it could be fit together, but still sound natural, like like somebody's just commenting? Like, was it was that hard as a as a recording kind of directing actors kind of process? Um, uh, yeah, well, we got, like, good people. We had two guys, one guy who I didn't know who it was, and the other guy was, like, uh, the actual 
my war sports guy. That mm. one. What's his name? I forgot his name. <laughs> but Jim, was it his name? I forgot. But a- Abe would know. He's a sports I'm, guy. I'm trying to think. I can't remember. <laughs> Is it the, like the actual one of the golf commentators? Yeah, the, 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 the actual guy, name? Jim McKay or whatever his uh, yeah. whatever his name. Uh, I don't know who it is, but so he would. And they and and so the, I think the trick was to record them kind of quickly. Like you know, there was like um, it was all kind of. Um, a lot of one takes and stuff like that, and mm-hmm. we had like at that time some kind of like uh, voiceover software where you could just kind of you know didn't have to keep on typing file names. You just hit go, and it would like mm-hmm. assign a new take, a new file name. So I think a lot of it was like you know just just kind of doing the, doing them quickly so that you don't have time to try to. There was no like you're not acting the parts. He was just like speaking, so it mm-hmm. kind of made it kind of easy. And then we would edit things together, and then you know we'd bring them back in if like we couldn't. You, Couldn't figure out how to connect fit. them, but once yeah. you figured out, oh, when you're when you're saying the numbers, you have to do it with this inflection. Then you could say all the numbers, and mm. they would, and as long as they're kind of the same, you would, you know, kind of do it. Do you remember? Do you remember what software you were using to do the dialogue editing? Because I, I, mean, I was doing a lot of dialogue editing for TV in 2008, and it was tedious. And so I imagine in 1997, it it was. Probably still, t- it was tedious then. Well, it, it, more it, so. you know, this was, this was not something that would, uh, uh, what it would do, would just, I forgot what it was called, actually, mm-hmm. but it was something where you just, like, once you'd, like, you know, whatever, import your text file, your script, basically, with your file names, mm-hmm. every time you hit, you know, enter, it would, like, it would, you know, create a new file with that file name, and then, and, and say, and, and whatever, and you're done, and so you can just keep on, and that's good. Okay, so you can kind of do that. So you end up with a million. They're not, you know, tightly edited, but but you have a million files that are all named correctly, which yeah. kind of helps. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I mean, the reason I asked about that is because uh, I know that uh, in sports games now, the um, that's become like its own, not very widely recognized art. Mm-hmm. I think to to put all those things together because you play a modern sports game, uh, that's become very advanced. The, the oh yeah. The, the making that not sound cut together when it obviously is right. And um, it's just interesting to me that you were dealing with that at, a, at an early time. I mean, right. was it your sense that not a lot of other people were doing stuff like that at the time, or were you just, or you didn't know? Or? I actually didn't really know. You know, I mean, um, uh, I don't, I don't recall a lot of games with a lot of um, continuous interactive voice stuff like mm-hmm. that. They were all pre-recorded things that were story based, as far as I knew. But you know, I, but I wasn't really. It's also relatively the early days of, of recorded audio in games, period, right? Because it, like, right. it was like CDs were, were still sort of new in like 96, 97. No, the first System Shock game came on like seven floppy disks because yeah, you yeah. could get it without any of the voiceovers. Yeah. They're all t- text files. And then they also released it on a CD where you could finally get the voiceovers. Yeah. You know, but, so, so, so would Thief have been sort of like after the golf game? Uh, or I, probably. I, you know what? I, what, I, what I should have done is actually go, like, look at the years before look this interview because I don't actually remember. No, that's I, fine. I think, I think so. Yeah, I think okay. it was a larger game. You know, but you can't remember anything in between. No, I think I did like, um, um, so a little bit on the uh, on one of the flight games. That game, uh, I think Thief would have been the next the next one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so there was like a few things in there, like the the flight game, and the golf yeah. game. I mean, I did like a couple. One of the first things I did when I got there was I did a couple like sound effects for Descent. You know that remember that? Oh game? yeah, yeah. And absolutely. that was not didn't work on the game, but it was basically like they needed someone to do some effects, and they sent over a list of like a hundred sound effects, and mm-hmm. we just did them and like threw them over the fence. Yeah, yeah. you know, um, <laughs> just because you know that's what. It, so yeah, it's not even like working on the game at all. We didn't have no, builds no, of the no, game no. or nothing. They were yeah, just like, yeah, hey. Yeah. Uh, you know, because back in those days, there not a lot of studios had dedicated sound designers. Yeah. You know, it was not. It was like programmers making sounds, or they'd have their buddy go out and do it. And uh, that's actually really interesting. So, uh, but but Looking Glass did. Yeah. And um, that strikes me as very significant uh, because the company, at least from what I can tell, seemed to have a, a bit of a culture of sound being more important and having people like yourself or like Greg who were musicians uh, working at the company and. Uh, when you look at something like Thief, of course, sound being so central to the gameplay in ways that even in stealth games now, it's not even quite as much, right. I, I think. Um, and even going back to stuff like System Shock with the importance of audio and the storytelling mm-hmm. and stuff, it seems to me like, it seems to me there's something not coincidental about the fact that you have Looking Glass that has such an emphasis on sound, that has dedicated audio people, and then then some of you go off to companies like Harmonix, and that, that's kind of interesting to me, that, well, that I legacy. Th- I think early on, uh, it used to be that um, 
you know, first most most companies were small, right? So they had some artists and they had programmers and a designer or two and stuff like that. But very few had you know sound people that were on staff, and they would either contract out the sounds. And so even when you did that, they would they would do like kind of what I a little bit I did for Descent. You get this list, they do some sounds, they mail them to you. The, the programmer, whoever would incorporate them into the game, mm-hmm. and that was kind of the model for quite a long time. And and the, and I think one of the best things, I think one of the ways that Looking Glass was fairly forward thinking, is that they they brought people, they brought people in house so that you can kind of like live with the game and absorb the game and all that kind of stuff. And then they took, they, they kind of quickly took the step to. Uh, uh, Put all, a lot of the the, um, the integration abilities into non coders hands. So um, in Thief we had um, oh yeah the tool set the lets tools, you do all exactly, that stuff because you yeah. know like I didn't know how to code so bef- you know in Terra Nova I remember like taking stuff I have to walk over to the, the programmer I was mm. working with and okay now do this oh don't play it that it had no control over volume or pan- or panning or, or any of that kind yeah, of stuff yeah, so yeah. it's like you know put this in and this is how I imagine it and you have this big conversation and. And that's you know that work you know if the guys the guys good and it works okay it worked good. but we in, it also takes a lot of time it's too. a lot of time and yeah. sometimes you're you don't have a dedicated programmer to you so he's like okay yeah but I'm working on UI stuff so I'm going to get to it when I get to it and yeah. so the turnaround between trying to get stuff that you're working on is 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 long you know weeks sometimes mm. you know. Um, and in Thief, we developed a whole kind of just text file based editing system where the engine would basically, anytime some, anything happened in the game, it would spit out an event to the, you know, which is, happens a lot, right? Nowadays, this is what the, everything, but it would just spit out something to the, to the audio engine. And then uh, we could basically just uh, uh, kind of make up our own names for tags. I could tag any item with something like this. Mm-hmm. So you could, once they kind of did that, you know, I could go in and like add all the footstep sounds myself. I could go in and add all the gunshot sounds, or if I wanted to uh, do something different. Well, I wonder if I can uh, every time this thing appears, you know, because every time something, every time an object was drawn, they would send a create vent right to the sound system, and I could choose whether I wanted to hook something out up to it, and there was just a giant database of it would just look up a, a you know an event and a series of tags, and if something matched, it would play a sound. So, so you got to, in some sense. Design, do what a designer or a programmer would have normally done in terms of... But it sounds like that you had more authorial control over yeah. over what was going on with the sound of the game. Yeah, you would all... And also, yeah, choose... I think that we're going to play a sound here. I think we're not going to play a sound here. So um, so for all the in-game events, yes, because they had this great tool that was kind of open And once in a while, there was something that couldn't be handled and you have to go talk to someone. This is a special case thing, you know. Uh, at the same time, um, we were doing stuff like... Um, uh, learning how to use the level editor so that uh, for two reasons one so we can actually open up the uh, you know we would check out the level they were that an artist was working on and I would be dropping you know hmm. points sound objects and all this kind of stuff so you can kind of uh, really do all the hookup of like okay when you walk through the store this is what happens or when you hmm. and your cross room was over here and these objects are radiating this kind of sound and this kind of stuff so you could do the whole all of the ambient and and music in the game we could just do ourselves without yeah. without any programmer help, and and I also did a, we did, did a lot of stuff like making test levels. Like I had, I would build myself a, a room that was like twenty foot by twenty foot with all the textures that the game has, or all the styles. Like here's the gravel, and here's the sand, and here's the grass, and here's the rock, and here's the marble, and here's the, and then I could like you know bring crates in there, and I could after we hook up sounds for physics. I throw them around and test them, you know. And it sounds like a, like a virtual Foley studio or something. Yeah, or, or, like or yeah. a way to test it, right? In game, yeah, yeah, before yeah. I actually wanted to like add these things, I could try and uh, you know, and we could kind of, you know, um, because it was all a, a lot of the stuff was text based. We didn't have to rebuild the entire game to test something new. I yeah. could just like, oh, let me tweak the values on this text file and then re-import the file and yeah, and then run the game again. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's better. You know. Yeah, that's so. Yeah, that that strikes me as really interesting because I know that when, um, uh, when, again, when we were talking to Greg, it, it, it's really he was the lead on Thief, correct? Or eventually, that's right. mm-hmm. eventually. At that at that time, I think he was not the audio department lead, but he was actually the project lead. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's significant to me that you have a game where sound is so important, and the person in charge is a guy who who's exactly. a musician. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm interested in. In um, I guess maybe some examples of, of of stuff in the game that maybe you've remembered or you thought worked particularly well, or 
or I don't know, or um, may, I don't know if that's a useful <laughs> way to construct a question. Um, well, I think that um, I mean, you know, I'm I'm not really that enamored or not enamored with you know particular sound effects or something like mm -hmm. that because. Um, you know, I, I think one thing I learned during this process is that almost anything can work as long as it's like placed properly hmm. in you know in in the level. And like it's easier to make a bad sound effect sound good by using it correctly. And um, that and, and, I mean that that you can kind of do where it's if you have a, a great sound effect that's used improperly. That makes that sound effect sound really bad, you know. It's, Can you think of an example of, of, of like a bad sound effect? Oh, there's a lot of bad sound effects. In these. <laughs> but I thought, as a whole, I was fairly happy with like as a whole as a sonic texture for the whole game. Um, I was pretty happy. I mean, we did a lot of things with just um, really short loops because again, in Thief we had no streaming audio mm. of any kind either in the, that, that first game. So um, everything was really done with you know um, five second loops or mm. eight second loops and. Sometimes, if I needed a long one, like we did, uh, the longest one in the game, I think, is uh, there's a level called the Horn of Quintus where it's like you travel through these catacombs and you're trying to follow this sound that... that um, the sound of the horn, right? It's of kind of horn. echoing in the caverns right. and you're following it. And, um, and so we needed something that was like going to play the entire level and not drive you totally crazy, you know? By repeating too much. By repeating too yeah. much, right? So... Uh, that was like the longest one. That's maybe a twenty-second sample, mm. and it's probably it's like probably eight bit, eleven k. You know, it's really you mm. know it's really crappy sounding. Um, it's, I, I remember it being kind of haunting. Well, I mean, well, <laughs> but good. that's good. <laughs> that's good. I mean, because that was sort of something I was kind of worried about. Um, and the cool thing about the engine, the way the way the um, the engine we had, Dramed, right, was the name of the engine yeah. right there. Um, they had very good sound propagation, um, uh, which means that uh, they, could, they could place this thing, you know, 5,000 yards over here, and you do the radiuses. If the level was built, rec built correctly and, and the stuff was right, it would, the sound would actually travel, you know, snake through the things, and you could, mm. and you could hear it uh, uh, with the, kind of at the proper volume and kind of coming from the proper direction, and, uh, you know, it would... Uh, um, it would, you know, we didn't have any like um, damping or anything, but based on texture or anything. But it would, it would just basically all portal based. So, so if if that door over there, if that's a door and the sounds over on the opposite direction, you know, you would hear the sound coming through the door instead of through the wall and things like hmm. that. So, um, so that was really cool, and I thought it worked actually quite well. I imagine some of the thief fan community, which is, I don't know how familiar you are with them, but they're ample. They seem to be with all their levels and yeah, and they make their own custom stuff, and some of those are quite good. I played a couple of them early on. Oh yeah, I mean they still. Really awesome. it, what year is it? Two thousand eleven. They still use Dromed now. It's amazing, <laughs> <laughs> and they've like upgraded it with all this texture stuff, mm -hmm. and you know, I mean, they've done like some of them are really elaborate. Like they've hired voice actors, and it's just it's yeah, some of them are really good and really scary. And you know, what's cool is that most of them, um, they really kind of get the whole thief. Vibe, you know, and they're yeah. not—they're not looking. To, most of them are not looking to turn into something else. They're just trying I mean, to. The like, tone and the atmosphere. Yeah, and, the yeah. whole visually and you know sonically everything. They're trying to just like keep it going further, yeah, you know, yeah, rather yeah. than try to change things. It's kind of neat. No, that is uh, that is interesting. So when you were, I, I'm a little bit interested too in the, um, I guess, the kind of artistic direction for the game, and um, from a sound point of view, how I mean. Do you feel like there were kind of other people leading that direction, and you were just kind of following it and trying to like do justice to their concept? Or were you, do you did you have a strong concept yourself of of what that sound was, or like were you really following the visuals of the writing, or et cetera, et cetera? Um, the I mean, we we did we there wasn't really a strong concept other than we, the things we were keenly aware of were were that this is going to be the first game, um, the first uh, kind of stealth game. Um, uh, that was uh, really going to rely on on audio cues, um, and so we 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 put some kind of like uh, stakes in the ground. Like we didn't want a, a, a typical um, music soundtrack, you know, one that so because in a lot of games, in most games you have like okay, you have a, a sound effect bed and an ambient bed and everything, and then you have a music soundtrack that kind of goes on top, you know, and uh, like like a score. And so we kind of didn't want that. 
Um, Because we wanted to make sure there was enough space in the game so that you could kind of hear what's going on. That being said, I also wanted to make sure that every inch of the game had audio in it and there wasn't there were, there wasn't any kind of silence so um, um, and I think I learned um, one of the lessons that I think is one of the mo- most valuable lessons to me is that um, uh, um, kind of a, a less is more type of thing because a lot of the a lot of the like um, the ambience in the game they might just be like a, a four second loop that like that the drone that just is kind of going for a while and nothing else might happen for a little while. And it sounds really dull if you kind of think of it that way, but in the game, uh, we've, I, I sort of found that it kind of almost like hypnotized you and kind of sucked you in to what you were doing and made you very aware, aware because of, of the simplicity of what you were hearing, very aware of stuff around you, So, which worked in, in your advantage for like listening for your guards' footsteps or your enemies. And also, any time we added a new piece with just a hint of music, you know, you'd really... You'd you really, noticed the you music. Noticed it. Yeah. And I think that people, I've, I've seen, I've heard comments, you know, from people saying, talking about the music as if there's like some big score. And I'm like, what are you talking about? There, there's, there's nothing. Like, there's it like goes two like two this or three for a while, and then music. you get this one note. And, yeah. and it's almost like people use their imagination, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, because you've kind of like... Stripped away everything down to something that's really simple. So, um, so that part I was really interested in, and, and you know, a, as I was like actually going and trying to put sounds in levels and trying to play through them and see how things go, I think I quickly learned that this is this is going to work for this game, where you know we can just try to keep it um, simple and hypnotic, and like we didn't try to we didn't really try to make it scary or we didn't try to make it dramatic or or whatever. It, um, it is scary. But I think it, it's scary too. But, but but yeah, but that wasn't the. It conscious. wasn't really a goal. Yeah. Um, but we wanted to make it. Um, we we knew that we had to make it really immersive, and I think it ended up working by having kind of simple sounds that almost kind of lulled you into this like hypnotic state. You kind of like started really paying attention to your surroundings, both visually and orally, and I think that um, it's. I think it's one of the main reasons that the game works sonically. That is. A really good explanation of something that I was trying to articulate in my head earlier for a question, but I think that that is now that I think about it, yes, that is that is really interesting because I remember when you talk about this ambient um, sound, it's really striking ambient sound, right? It's not like the, about it's not like the kind of ambient sound I feel you hear in a lot of games, which is almost unnoticeable. It's just something so you don't have silence, but. This like the sound of being in. I think like in the first level, you're like you come in through the sewers. You know the instant you get to the first floor because you walk through a door and suddenly the whole ambient soundscape is is different. And 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 I think you're right. It does create that experience of it. It makes you suddenly stop and think, whoa, what's in here? Right. And, and, and then and then you start listening for what else you might be hearing aside from the ambience. And because we didn't have a kind of proper musical score. We took liberties with the ambience. Like well, the ambience were, are sometimes like realistic things. Oh, there's you know crickets and there's wind and there's like leaves rustling. There's a lot of that, but there's also just like oh, I'm walking around inside and there's just weird drone going. No, exactly. And yes, it's like, yes, and yes. that's not really a realistic thing. That was that was kind of the music, but functioning like the ambience. So we really wanted to. We really were blurring that line, trying to consciously blur that line between ambient sound mm. and and music, so that. They kind of became the same thing because because it is ambient sound, but you, you use it like music. Yeah, in in a lot of ways. And I have a very strong memory of downloading the demo back when it was just called the Dark Project. I mm-hmm. think before it was even called Thief. And I remember the. Um, it's kind of funny because Thief is famous for you know it's kind of like big emergent levels and nonlinear and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the cutscenes are great. I mean, it has these really focused, like really wonderful cutscenes that just like completely nail the feeling, right? It just, like, sets you up for the feeling and the atmosphere that then the uh, the levels kind of deliver on. I, I, I think that's true, and I think that, um, you know, uh, I'm glad to have played a part of that, but I think a lot of that is the visual design and the right. They had these really cool quotes, you know, in the front. They would have these, like, prophecy type of quotes. And they were all pretty cleverly written. They were really, you know, well, the, smart. And then the art was, was kind of simple, but... You know, oh no, it's pretty wonderful. awesome. You know, we knew we wanted to have this kind of, um, you know, they had the whole kind of like the term you hear a lot, steampunk kind of thing, right? Which, in, uh, you know, it's like old fashioned, 
but heavy machinery, stuff like that. So immediately, you know, we wanted to have some sort of industrial type of elements, you know, but we knew that we're not going to have in kind of industrial music in the game, you know. Um, so, and, and we, I think we had debates about this. I think there were people on the other side who were like, this doesn't fit the game at all, this kind of like, you know, louder, you know. The, the final piece you're talking about that's actually in the game. There was yeah, some the debate final, about Yeah, that. final, you know, guitar feedback and, and yeah. you know, fuzzy, that doesn't seem to, with the larger beat and stuff like, didn't really seem to fit. And there was some, they, you know, it was kind of polarizing, you know, yeah. because it was not in character. In fact, like, we'd always have this, whenever we would do a, a trailer or something to try to advertise the game, mm. we would sometimes use similar type of, you know, kind of more aggressive music. And then we'd have, the, you know, well, this doesn't really, you know, kind of tell you what the game's about mm. because the rest of the thing is kind of like at a, at a pace that's slower and and more deliberate. So, but, you know. That's a really interesting dichotomy to me, though. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having tonal variation, right, in, in the yeah. game. It's like the game uh, gives you this, like, awesome advertisement for itself, and then and then it kind of gives you this world in which you have to, you sort of have to live up to that music. You have to somehow create that sense of coolness for yourself just through how you behave. In the and game. we would and try like, to use, like, um, I, I would try to, I would, I would also try to use, like, some of the elements from that intro um, in other places in the game. Like, I, I, I had, there's some levels where I would, like, cut up a bunch of guitar feedback that I had used in the level hmm. into small pieces, and they would kind of play as, like, ambient sounds, the same way you might do hmm. a wind loop, you know, but they would just be, like, these things that would kind of crossfade and, you know, or... Um, there was some kind of like there's some kind of like bell tree sound that's kind of like a shaky ritualistic kind of sound. Mm. I remember using that in other places. So um, as much as possible, I mean, I was a big believer in like reusing stuff. You know, if I had something that I used over here, what can I can, can I do over here and play it backwards or pitch it down six steps or uh, or make it stereo and play the left side backwards? You know, yeah, because yeah, yeah. I think that. A, it's just a, an economy of resource of, of resources, sure. and B. Um, I think that it helps stitch these kind of disparate things together in some un uh, subconscious way. Yeah, I was about to actually say subconscious because it uh, it does give you a kind of a subconscious continuity between something on the surface which not might not seem related, which is that kind of hard intro mm -hmm. music and then the kind of ambient sound design of the game. An, an interesting thing that kind of happened to me as we were talking about like uh, spareness and, and kind of like lulling you in, hypnotizing you, I think that... In the later Thief games, like uh, I did the second one and, and the third Thief game also, and in both of those we had the third, which was not Looking Glass. No, the third one was done right. Third, uh, was Iron Storm. Iron Storm, right? Yeah. Um, um, but I did that one also, and um, and you know by that time we could stream stuff, so a lot of the, the pieces were kind of um, you know two minute, still done, still the same thing. Like you try to blur ambient and music and stuff like that. But there's something about them being like larger, larger loops that were more kind of uh, thoughtfully put together. That was nice in a way, but also I think took away in a way and didn't give me the same quite that I wasn't. I didn't think they lulled the player into the into the game as effectively as the first one. I think, actually, so I think that's really interesting because I'm thinking about modern sound design approaches and how not everybody is thinking about trying to have coherence to the entirety of their sound design, right? It's, I need an explosion, I find, I build an explosion, I put mm. it in, or I need this gun, I put it in. It's not, it's not how do I create a sonic world that works. And it's really, I think it's really great to hear that, you know, what, you know 14 years ago now, right? Like, people, like... Inspired somewhat by the technological limitations as well, right. right? But but you're working, you know, on trying to develop a coherent sonic space because uh, I think we'd have better sounding games if more people thought that way. And so, like, that's or, or more unique. I mean, I, I think the idea is that like you can like take a random clip of Thief, you know what I mean, and kind of recognize it as Thief, sure. where it would be harder to take a random clip of. I mean, I think some of the, no. I, 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 you know, I think that a lot of games nowadays have awesome sound, and they're, they, they're way more advanced, and they, and, they, and they are really, uh, really good. And and you know, uh, like, so once in a while, like something will remind me. I'll, I'll go like like, and I'll go run through some of the old sound effects that I did. If I just click on the wave, I'm like, oh my god, that is so terrible. <laughs> How did I actually <laughs> let that go into the game? But I think that so the one the thing that saves it is on a whole. There's this kind of sure. you know. Thing sure. that like makes them kind of fit together, and 
neither, almost no sound in the entire game is very important, but hopefully they come together in some, like, unique is, is good, because that, I think, is, I think unique is, is, um, is one of the most important things that we get to miss, right? We all, and in, in all, in, as, as movies are, like, so sophisticated and stuff like that, everyone has this, like, you know, great composer writing this great music, and you know what? You can't help but they all start to sound the same, right? Yeah, yeah. Even if it's really, really yeah. awesome, it sounds the same. And yeah. they're all Hans Zimmer, right? Or, <laughs> yeah, I mean, not, or, or somebody else. Yeah. But, yeah. And games are kind of like, as in the last like ten years, um, all games are now orchestral things, and they go rent this orchestra and they do that. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And it's really awesome. And the it's music good. Is, it is good. Really getting yeah. good. But we're starting to suffer from the same things. There's not that much unique, you know. Yeah. You know, so so it's nice when you see like limbo come out, right? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah, like yeah. okay, different approach. Uh, not only does it catch your eye visually, but sonically, it's also yeah. Wow, this is focused in some kind of way that makes you remember it. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you, do you do you uh, have any other sense of like games that you like for for stuff like that, or stuff that's like jumped out at you in, in like the past ten years, maybe? Or? You know, uh, <laughs> just out of curiosity. Uh, you know, I. Um, the Half-Life game, games were awesome. They were kind of like a, a pinnacle of, of like, you know, of that kind of stuff. And you know what? I don't. I have to admit that I don't play games very much anymore. Oh, that's um, fine. And yeah. uh, so I'm not. I, I'll play some demos, and I will have friends, and I will watch them. You know, play games like that. But I don't actually really play. You know, a ton. Um, you know. You didn't uh, play Limbo. It sounds like. I did play Limbo a little bit. I mean, not a lot. You know, I didn't finish the game. Um, you know, I mean, I played Halo when it came out, and blah blah blah. You know, and I played Silent Hill because mm-hmm. that was kind of up my alley. I like, oh, this is going to be a good scary game. So, you also did System Shock Two, is mm-hmm. that correct? So, so how did that uh, come about? Because I know that that was that was like a joint Irrational. Irrational was just starting, and then that was so you didn't do System Shock One. That was Greg mostly. Correct? Right. I did. Uh, Greg was the the, the chief guy and. System Shock One. I mean, I helped. I helped doing some of the audio logs, you know, um, and I helped do like a lot of the, loca- uh, the localization logs. But I wasn't a sound designer or didn't write the music mm. for that, you know. I was. But you of, did on two, so you were like, on two, yeah, I was the guy, yeah. Two, okay. So. so, so did you? So, um, as opposed to the Thief series, where you were, sort of, you know, where you were like the author of the sound experience of, of the game, um, you were kind of. Would you have a strong sense of like trying to? kind of begin where Greg had been in a certain way or was it very more just kind of like well this is a a different project um, um uh no we, we wanted to um it was funny um we wanted to keep uh, you know first of all we it was built on the thief engine it was using uh the drama in fact it was built in the looking glass studios cuz uh, irrational was there and but they had moved into some offices right up, you know right where we were and they were sharing the same tech as mm-hmm. uh, I think as we were making uh, Thief 2, I think they were hmm. making System Shock 2. So, um, and part of the deal with them uh, uh, being there was that they would use some of Looking Glass's folks. So they used um, some of the R Tech team to help like, keep hmm. on polishing up the engine. And maybe, I don't remember if they used any artists or something, but they used Looking Glass's audio department. So, um, uh, so we wanted to, no, we wanted to keep it like System Shock. But bring in some of the elements of that the drama engine did well, like which is the whole stu- you know there you know a little bit of the stealth thing. Now you know mm-hmm. S- System Shock is much more of an action game than Thief was. But um, I remember having one conversation that lasted about twenty seconds with Greg because he was kind of there, and we were thinking about whether we should re envision Shodan's voice, you know, or not. Um, and so we were like, okay, so should we, this is, this is a big part of System Shock 1, should we kind of progress and change and try to figure out what the next evolution of how she should sound? And then I think we talked about it for like 20 seconds, and we're like, no, fuck it, no, this has got to be the same. <laughs> it was so cool the first way, we're going to try to do it exactly the same. So one of the things that we try to do a direct copy of is, you know, when we did voice processing for S- System Shock 2, we tried to copy the same, we tried to make sure it in the same 
you know, exact voice in the first one because it was so cool. You know? So that's really interesting because when we talked to Greg, one of the things he talked a lot about was how hard it was to create the Shodan voice because he had to do all those stutters by hand because of the sound technology of the time. And I'm wondering, so for you trying to recreate that same thing a few years later with different technology, I'm wondering how that process was. It was exactly the same because I, I had done I had done some of that on the like on like the French and German version on the on the first one. So I had knew I know I knew how the the because they're, they're right they're all hand done right hmm. all like and we back then uh, we set them up um, you know uh, back then we uh, for the first system shock I think they used deck which is like an early four track you know uh, DAW basically hmm. right so um, and so I, I kind of knew because because I didn't do the the English ones but I did some of the French or German show dance you know where we had to like cut up stuff and because they're they, they all had to be done separately by hand too. So I kind of knew how it was done, and we actually did. It was exactly the same, you know. I mean, I used Peak for System Shock Two and Digital Performer, but it was exactly the same. Basically, you know, you bring the first. We did some processing on the voice to get it into the kind of character, you know, uh, into the you know some you know, distortion and some doubling to kind of make it sound like a, a mechanical voice, and then we would cut up and you know just try to like listen through and find places we thought we would stutter it just by copy and pasting and and it was just like a lot of like okay let's take this line and pitch it up a lot and stretch it out and do this and pitch it down and you know maybe add a second one that like echoes what she said the idea was the idea was basically um, I like the idea that whenever she was talking about something that annoyed her we let her spin off a little bit like so if she was talking about the intruder or something she might go the intru- it, it, she couldn't spit it out and then and it would like come out in a burst and then when she's just talking about normal stuff maybe she would calm down so I was trying to try to make it but it was the same done by hand in fact I remember telling uh, Ken talking with Ken Levine and because he Ken Levine is an awesome awesome writer but he likes to write and rewrite you know hmm. and so you know we said I'm not do- doing any of the show to end processing until the script is completely locked because because it took it took two to four hours per line to chop up and turn wow. it into... How many lines total, do you think? Uh, um, for the Shonan voices, uh, I don't know, 150 oh, wow. something. And that's just Shodan. Just Shodan, yeah. The other ones, like the regular, the other logs, like the, the logs that you hear just from the crew members, they were, um, they had to be, you know, like, uh, put together also you know but they were they were they were you know not nearly as complicated it was just basically you know you you we batch convert all the things so that they have a certain tonal quality and then for different different crew members or different decks we'd have different ambience that we put behind them and some were really orchestrated like you, maybe in the log there's some firefight going on so you'd have to like do kind of almost an audio post to this fictionary movie you know but um but but uh so those we could kind of do early on, but the showdown ones we up until the very up until the last couple of weeks, all the showdown Dan lines were just done. We just like uh, my wife is she recorded. Oh yeah. All the way, so it was just her speaking, you know, the parts normally. She can do that that creepy. Hello, how are you doing? Yeah, you know, like the, like the howl voice, the female kind of. howl voice yeah. that seems yeah. just like because there's something and even uh, there's something about. Um, you know, where the human cadence is slightly off, you know, like the pitch goes up maybe at some time where it shouldn't. So she can do that really well, like just like have it. So she is performing it. Yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. Um, she is, although all the stuttering and all the crazy stuff that happens is done mm. after the fact, but um, it, it works a lot better because she knows how to just like just the dry read is, is creepy because it's like slightly unnatural because you can tell it's a computer speaking to you because they know all of the rules of language, but they don't have any of the connotations behind it, and so that hmm. you know, the pacing and the timing is slightly different. So she can do that really well. So, yeah, I was uh, I was going to ask you before, but it sounds I think you already answered it, which was, um, what was the primary driving thing, uh, concern for when you were doing the pitch ups and all this kind of stuff, and was it just like what sounded cool, or was it about the character? And it sounds like it was largely about the character in a lot of ways. Like it was. You, it sounds like you had a very strong sense of who Shodan was. Like, this is a very clearly defined character. Uh, yeah, I mean, it wasn't really that... Uh, a strong sense, but not really that complex. It wasn't like there was, you know, I couldn't write pages on it or anything like that. But um, um, just, but the general sense that this is some, this is someone who is not alive, but thinks they are all-powerful, 
and thinks they are in control, but really aren't. They're it's like some haywire. You know, they're dealing with. It's almost like a, a computer dealing with being born, right? They have a lot of the infantile, mm. you know, things that a, that a baby has, right? Because they don't they don't know. They don't have like the maturity, the judgment yeah. around the world. So she throws fits. She throws fits, yeah. and we look. So um, whenever her line had something that I thought she's probably annoyed at this or irked, or she's mentioning her nemesis, then we would try to like, you know doctor up her voice in a way that made her sound like she was losing it for a second and then oh she pulled it back together because she's trying to be hmm. she's trying to be this perfect human so it was all like you know uh, I, I I think that the one thing that we struggled with with um, in System Shock 2 the, a lot of the Shodan lines were very instructional they were actually the thing telling you what to do because in System Shock 2 Shodan deceives you by pretending to be somebody else right. and then and then is sort of like your guide and but then, even after yeah. she's revealed she's still your guide she's still your guide telling you to do this so in System Shock 1, I remember listening to a lot of logs that were, a lot of them were like um, like insulting, you know, nice jump human and, you know, things like that. Oh, my God, I remember that part yeah. of the game. And, and so those were sinister just by what she was saying. The, I remember struggling with trying to make things sinister when it said, okay, go to deck five and press the yellow button and, and you know... The, right, the, the writing was, I don't mean to imply the writing it was, was dry. It wasn't dry no, no, at all. No, no. Yeah, yeah, However, yeah. but there was a lot of instructional stuff. You yeah. know, first you must do this, then you must do that. And that part was like, okay, I'm trying to find creative ways to keep her in character without her having flip out, you know, about something stupid. So it was kind of tricky to, to try to keep the same intensity going when but, she's actually not yelling at you or calling you an insect. And it sounds like the sound design otherwise for the game, because it was um, in Dromed and it was mm -hmm. very Thief-inspired, was it? Was there more kind of a focus on ambience in, in um, uh, well, we had Shock 2? The, the thing that was different is that we, had, we did have, in, uh, because this was more of an action game, we did have like a separate musical score from the ambience, you know, and that, and that you could turn off in the... That was very different from Thief. Yeah, you know. Now, a lot of the ambiences we did were still... Um, um, atmospheric uh, are not like non-realistic you know hums and thrums and things like that mm. um, but because the world was also so much denser we got a lot of uh, then System Shock 1 or Thief? then Thief excuse me okay uh, meaning there was like there's computers everywhere there's buzzing lights there's mm. stuff we had just a lot more stuff to like technology in the world yeah. as opposed so to we Thief could, yeah. we could we would do you know uh, we'd try to come up with some cool sounding little loop of bleeps and stuff that was kind of creepy and hook that so you have you had a lot of that so this had so System Shock 2 did have a um, did have a separate score um, and I didn't actually write the music most of the music for System Shock 2 it was mm -hmm. it was written mostly by Josh Randall who I work with that um, mm -hmm. he wrote most of the kind of faster techno style stuff and by a guy who had just started at um, Looking Glass uh, named uh, Ramin um, Jawadi mm -hmm. who actually is now in Hollywood he's done like you know, music for, uh, I think he does music for the Game of Thrones HBO thing. Oh, wow. And he's, he's, yeah. He worked with Hans Zimmer for a while and is kind of working his way up the cool. chain and actually doing his own movies and stuff like that. Oh, wow, cool. And he did a lot of the kind of more um, slower, creepy uh, music. And more, something you might more associate with horror. Kind of. Yes, right. And so... Um, I did most of the. I did. I contributed a, a few pieces of music on my own, but mostly I took their stuff and did some remixing and integrating into the mm -hmm. game and lay them out in, into the into the levels, you know. But but we we definitely treated it as a separate thing that you could turn off if you wanted to. Um, so we so we had this thing where we were trying to make the ambiences. If you decided to turn the music off. We still wanted the ambiences to evoke enough atmosphere that you felt. But you still can't turn off the ambience, is that correct? You can't turn off the ambience in this okay. one, no. But you could turn off the music like you can in most of every other okay. game, you know. Okay. Um, and then, then we had, you know, we had a lot of people who just loved the music. They thought it was really awesome because it, it actually is really cool. Yeah. But we had some purists who were like, oh, no, it's getting, my, it's getting in my way of, you know, yeah. my thief-style yeah. exploration, which and I can kind of see both points. But, uh, yeah. So it sounds because some fans were sort of encountering it because a lot of people didn't play System Shock One, so right. some fans were encountering it as kind of an extension of what they knew from Thief, and some people were encountering it as a sequel to System Shock. Exactly, Shark. yeah. And some of the people, you know, so it's kind of both too, right? It I mean, is. It's, it's kind of like a like a Thief offshoot and also like a System Shock sequel. Yeah, I mean, we, it, it, I mean, right then we we, you know, we were just coming off. Um, Thief 1, and we were like, you know, we liked all of the, we thought that kind of like, wow, the fact that you can kind of hear what's going on and have those be cues, that's, that's important. We should, why drop that for this game? You know, we want, 
we want that whole thing, you know, part of System Shock 2 is also sneaking around. And, and a lot of the AI for the, the, the guys who are your enemies is the, very The creatures similar, and mutants and robots is, and stuff. Is very similar to Thief. So if you stand still, they won't notice you. And, you know, all the kind of same stuff that you could do in Thief, you could do in System Shock 2. That wasn't the really the central, uh, uh, the central part of the game. It's much more mm-hmm. action oriented. So a lot of people didn't even realize that if you just shut up, the guys will probably walk right by you. You know, <laughs> um, but it still works because it's it still, still works. It's still in the system. Yeah, yeah, it inherits a lot of that. One of the things I've been asking people and and uh, is, I mean, obviously, and I mentioned before, you know, working at Harmonix now, being you know famous for being a sound music oriented company. Is there anything? I don't know if the best way to even articulate this, but anything you learned or any of your experience or how you think about sound over the course of your career, like how does that does that transition in any way into into what you do in harmonics? Like, do you see that as connected with the stuff you were doing at Looking Glass, or do you see it as more of kind of a different different thing? Um, it, well, the stuff at Harmonix is, uh, you know, quite a bit different. You know, a we're usually dealing with uh, music-centric games, which means music is up front, you know, and sound effects or atmosphere is less of a thing, right? And we're usually dealing with licensed music in most of our games, which means that we're not even like writing, you know, uh, evocative things. It's, it's about something different. Um, so there are, um, I think, there are a lot of. Um, of differences, of course, um, but I mean, but I, you know, I, I think a lot of, the, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, um, experience from doing the um, the other kind of more traditional games, you know, Thief and System Shock and stuff, of course, um, um, you know, teaches you about all the other. I mean, we still have sound effects in our games, mm-hmm. and you know, and, and it's just, a, but the approach is quite. Is quite different. Um, I think that it was quite, um, it was quite different for me. And as soon as I kind of like came to harmonics, I remember like, oh, I miss kind of doing, kind of, sound and in, in in a three D world and things like that, you know. And and but you know, soon di- you know dove into other stuff. You know, we did a lot of obviously with, with the harmonics. We do a lot of like transcribing and you know, uh, turning, trying to turn. Um, the, this music into these kind of abstract, you know, uh, things that kind of try to represent the music as best we can mm-hmm. on the, even though they're not, they're not real transcriptions. And that was kind of a challenge and a good way of thinking about it. But um, um, I'm not sure how directly, I mean, I, other than the general experience of, of like kind of. Well, I, I think I think maybe, maybe what I'm wondering is, um, I guess I'm struck by the, um, by maybe the culture of a company like Looking Glass, where you have these people who are musicians in positions of guidance, mm-hmm. um, and uh, is there? I guess I'm wondering: is there, is there a similar vibe? At, at, I mean, obviously there would be at Harmonics, and 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 I'm I'm just interested in sound being important, mm-hmm. not being the last cog of the, you know, of the mm-hmm. engine, um, is something that that I would imagine is even more uh, emphasized, probably more at Harmonix than probably almost any other company. And but it does seem like um, that I, won't, I don't know if "got started" is the right word, but it definitely I would I would imagine there's some carryover from the experience of a company like Looking Glass, where where that was also extremely important. Yes, I think I, I think that's true. I mean, we have um, uh, there are a number a number of people from Looking Glass who work at at Harmonix, you know, and a number uh, and and some of them. You know, are kind of musicians first. You know, even some of the coders are actually musicians first, and they go and they they play in bands and stuff like and, and that. So, um, so yeah, I think you have this. Uh, there is this, you know, certainly this mentality that uh, you know that sound is never just the veneer that we the polish that we put on top at the very end. <laughs> 